Okay, um, my name is Jill Murray, and I'd like to welcome you to our public seminar on the role of languages in a multicultural society. Um, Oriana Echevedo and I will be co-hosting this. So I'll first introduce myself briefly, and then um, Oriana can introduce herself. I'm a lecturer and a researcher at Macquarie University, and I'm an applied linguist, um, and I'm a member of the multi Lingual Research Center at Macquarie University. Um, Ariana, would you like to introduce yourself? You've just muted yourself there. I'm muted, okay. <laughs> um, I'm Ariana, I work for the State Library of New South Wales. And in my role, I also work with the public libraries, uh, which are supported by local government. And there's more than 300 access points um, we, public libraries actually provide services from English conversation classes, a whole range of programs, uh, collections in different language. And so we're here to have a really interesting conversation. Thank you. Um, before we commence, I'm going to uh, read the acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which Macquarie University is situated the Watamatagal people of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. The State Library of New South Wales acknowledges the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land and waters upon which the library was built. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the seminar. We pay our respects to Aboriginal elders, past, present and future, and extend that respect to other First Nations people. So today we have um, with us as our main speakers, Professor John Hadjek from the University of Melbourne and Professor Phil Benson from Macquarie University. Um, uh, Professor Benson's going to go first, and so I'll introduce him first. He's a professor of, of applied linguistics at Macquarie University, and he's the director of the Multilingual Research Centre. He's published in a wide range of areas relating to second language teaching and research, including learner autonomy, study abroad, and curriculum innovation. And he's also written quite a bit about research methods, including um, the use of narrative research techniques. His current major focus of interest is linguistic landscapes and multilingual cities. And with Alice Cheek and Robin Maloney, he's the co-editor of um, the recent publication from the Multilingual Research Centre, Multilingual Sydney. So um, please welcome Phil Benson. Don't forget to put your questions in the chat if questions occur to you while you're watching his presentation, and we'll deal with them at the end of the session. Thank you. Over to you, Phil. Thank you very much, Jill, and um, and thank you to everybody who is with us. I'm just sharing my screen. Thank you to everybody who can join us. Um, I think you can see my PowerPoint. Can you? Yeah. Um, Just a second, sorry. Um, okay. Got this under control now. Okay. Um, the role of languages in a multicultural society is the topic we set for this dialogue. Um, I'm just going to make two points and I'm going to do them fairly quickly without going into a great deal of detail um, because we are going to have um, a dialogue later. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for discussion and um, what I really want to do is throw out some ideas um, that you may want to pick up and discuss later. Uh, the first point I want to make is that we live in a new world of language and cultural mobility and to sort of demonstrate that I'm going to bombard you with statistics and my argument is basically that pretty much everything that's relevant to multiculturalism and multicultural multilingualism in Australia and globally has doubled, doubled in the 21st century. Now, I, I tend to think that the 21st century began yesterday 
I've not quite caught up with it yet. So it surprises me that there's been so much change just over the last 10 or 20 years, um, which really means we're in the, we, 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 we are in a new world as far as thinking about um, language and multiculturalism. Um, and my second point will be to raise five issues, which I'll come to later, which I think are relevant to how we may rethink issues of language policy for this new world of multiculturalism. So here come the statistics. Um, okay. So what's doubled in the 21st century? I'm going to be looking at issues that are really concerned with mobility of people, goods, information, and all importantly, languages. Uh, there's a little footnote there. Uh, these statistics actually come from all over the place. Uh, please take them with a pinch of salt. Um, mostly they come from the World Bank, from the Australian government, and a couple from other sources, but I'm not going to bore you um, with the details of where they come from. Um, people. Okay, now if something has increased by 100%, it's doubled, yes? Um, so the increases are in percentages. If it's increased by more than 100%, it's more than doubled, and less than 100%, it's a bit less than doubled. Okay, so international air passengers between 2000 and 2018 has more than doubled, increased by 150%. International migrants, 2000 to 2019, um, almost doubled, 85%. International refugees, the same period, 86%. The number of international students globally, these are all global statistics, um, between 2000 and 2017, increased by 165%. So it, it more than doubled. Goods, international air freight, 2000 to 2018, increased by 87%. Container port traffic, increased by 250%. Um, that means it, 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 it trebled, more than trebled. And international remittances, meaning money that's sent from one country to another country, between 20, 2000 and 2020, increased by 450%. That means it's increased four and a half times over that period. Information, um, if I go back to 2000, these statistics are crazy regarding in the internet and information, but uh, just over the eight years from 2019, between 2009 and 2017, the number of internet users doubled. Uh, mobile phone use um, increased between the same period by 80%. Um, mobile phone use is not going to, mobile phones are not going to increase that rapidly now because basically everybody, there's more than one mobile phone per person on the planet. Uh, so we've all we've all got at least one mobile phone, and some of us have got two or two or more. Um, languages, which is brings us really to the point um, of what we're talking about today. Global language services between two thousand and the value, sorry, the value of global language services between two thousand and nine and two thousand and eighteen doubled. It increased by a hundred percent. And that basically means the translation and interpreting industries um, and uh, uh, product localization, multilingual packaging, multilingual advertising, this kind of thing, um, and also language education. But in terms of the value of the value of uh, language teaching is, is only a small fraction of the global languages services um, industry. I think it's about five to 10 percent of that. Um, it's very difficult to find statistics on um, the on language teaching as such or language learning. Uh, but one statistic is between 2011 and 2017. Um, that's only a six year period, uh, but um, globally IELTS test takers increased by 76%. So that's just a, some indication that language teaching is also keeping up with this kind of development. Um, now, my point here really is that everything we're experiencing in Australia in terms of multiculturalism and multilingualism at the present time 
is really an effect or a, it's part of this whole process of global mobility, of this really rapid acceleration in global mobility. It's not something that's unique to Australia by any means. And in fact, um, Australia is experiencing these things to a slightly lesser, lesser extent than the rest of the rest of the world is. Uh, but these are statistics that are be perhaps a bit more familiar. Overseas born residents in Australia increased uh, by 66% in the 20th century, 21st century. International students by 250%. Uh, visitor visas granted between 2010 and 2018, they increased by 100%, they doubled. So the number of visitors, overseas visitors doubled. Um, pretty much doubled in the last 10 years. Um, and language other than English is speakers in census, in the census um, increased between 2001 and 2016, 50, 15 years increased by 70%. So where we are at the moment in New South Wales, um, according to my calculation, there are 215 different languages spoken in New South Wales in two, in the two, recorded in the 2000 and 16 census, and 76 of those languages have more than a thousand speakers. Um, I may be taken to task actually for using the word lot or languages other than English. Um, I'm using that, I realize that term is not the best term that we have to refer to the different languages, community languages that are spoken, um, but it's the term that's used in the census and I'll be referring to census statistics. So that's why I'm sticking with that particular term. So my main point here is that in terms of languages and multiculturalism, we really have to take account of this new world that we're living in. It's not the same world that we were in 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I think it's fair to say, it's often said that Australia is a country that's built on migration. And I think that's true. 20th century Australia certainly was built on migration. It's probably more true now to say that 21st century multicultural Australia is built on global mobility. Um, it's, it's, my, migration is less significant really than the mobility of people, goods and information coming in and out of the of the country. Um, Australia has led multilingual and multicultural policies since the 1970s. And I think we have a question now of how we begin to rethink those language policies for this new world of multiculturalism. Um, you're probably all thinking and quite reasonably that everything I've said that has doubled in the 20th century, probably halved again or more than halved in, in the year 2020, in the last year we've been through um, due to the COVID pandemic. Um, and that's an interesting point because the, 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 first of all, the pandemic is, is actually part of this process. It's really, um, it's, it's, it's really a, a kind of symptom. It's, it's something that's occurred or, or been particularly serious because of this very rapid acceleration of mobility of people particularly. Um, uh, and it's also been the thing that's been most affected by the pandemic. So we don't know where we're going in the future with this. And it's not clear yet what kinds of impact it's going to have on multiculturalism or multilingualism. Um, certainly, it's going to have some impact. Um, but the effects of that are not quite clear at the moment. Okay, so I want to come to my five issues. And I'm not going to go into them in any great detail, but I just want to raise these as issues that I believe that we need to, to think about um, and perhaps can be taken up in dialogue. Um, and they are the idea of multilingual cities, the idea of linguistic super diversity, uh, transnationalism, flexible language provision, and what I call contextual data sets. And I'm going to round up at the end, I'm just going to say something very briefly to try to illustrate how important I believe data is and the way that data is presented. By multilingual cities, I mean that multilingualism and a lot of the statistics that we've looked at uh, earlier 
just now are tied up with urbanization on a global scale. Um, so we see that in Australia, for example, the languages other than English speakers is 21% in Australia, but it's 38% in Sydney. It's concentrated in Sydney. And also we have a similar, I don't know the exact figure for Melbourne, but it's a, it's a similar figure for Melbourne. And then that figure sort of tails off as we get to the other regional capitals and regional Australia. Um, it's quite typical to have neighborhoods in Sydney with more than 70% of speakers of languages other than English and other neighborhoods where there are actually very few. Um, so what we see there really is that the language dimensions of multiculturalism, the relationship of, of languages to multiculturalism is intensified in cities. Um, and then we also get particular issues it doesn't mean that they don't affect regional rural areas, but we have particular different issues in regional and rural areas. Linguistic superdiversity, um, as compared with the situation in the 20th century, I believe now we have many languages with very variable numbers of speakers. Some of them have hundreds of thousands of speakers in Sydney. Some have, you know, 30, 40 speakers only. Um, we have we have Auslan and we have um, the other sign languages that um, migrants have brought to Australia. Uh, we have indigenous languages. We also have mixed languages. We have varieties of English um, that are that are associated with indigenous languages, uh, which bring particular issues with them. So each language has its own issues, and there's a lot of languages um, involved in in multilingualism. And also those neighborhoods with a high percentage of languages than languages other than English speakers, those with 70% or more are usually very diverse. So, they, so it's not 70% of the suburb speaks one language. That tends to go with there being many languages in each suburb. Um, and lastly, there are quite complex relationships between languages place of residence and access to employment and access to services. Um, these are not localized, but they tend to be distributed across the city. Transnationalism, uh, a very important feature that distinguishes the migration of the 21st century from migration of the 20, 20th century is that there's a great deal of transient or temporary migration. There's a lot of moving back and forth and um, international students and, and temporary visitors of various kinds, temporary workers are far, far more numerous than uh, permanent, permanent migrants. Um, people maintain international connections. They, they, there's a great deal of use of global communications, media, social media, and also sort of TV and um, TV media. Um, and I think this means that we have to start to move beyond discourses of language and settlement or language and integration particularly, and also beyond the importance, um, a sort of automatic assumption that English is this really important language. It's the most important language. Everybody needs to know, everybody needs to know English. Um, English is important. I'll come to this in just as I'm concluding, um, but we need to, to kind of bracket that assumption and try to think outside that box that we always begin from this necessity for everybody to know and to be fluent in English and for this to be crucial to integration. Uh, fle flexible language provision. Um, I think I'm looking more at what needs to be done in terms of language policy. Whatever language policies we have, they have to be responsive to multiple languages. They have to be responsive to relationships between languages and social participation. Um, to speak a language, it's a very uneven thing using languages other than English. Some languages have much more sort of privilege attached to them than, than other languages do. Um, we need to be responsive to changing local patterns of language use, uh, supportive of community driven initiatives. Um, and again, moving beyond discourses of, of priority languages. Um, as I say, there are 215 significant languages used in New South Wales, and we need to, to have ways of, of 
treating those languages equally, at least equally, uh, or of making sure that everybody, um, all of those languages have some representation, some sort of voice. Uh, lastly, this idea of contextual data sets, basically, um, as far as multilingualism and multiculturalism is concerned, we tend to rely on census data, which internationally is very good, actually. Um, other countries, the UK especially, is very envious of Australia's census data because they have terrible census data. But I think we know that the census data is really inadequate for, for a lot of reasons that I won't go into, uh, but it's really inadequate as a, uh, as, as a kind of measure or evaluation of degrees of multilingualism, mostly because it's based on residence, it's based on where people, what they do at home rather than what they do outside the home. And, and this is the point I'll come to to, to, to tie up, it's very often inaccurately reported. Um, but going beyond that, I think it's important that we will need to develop more what I call contextual data sets, which are, for example, for education, for employment, for access to services, um, for localities, etc. cetera, um, that we may need to think about having a central clearinghouse for big data sets. And um, in addition to that, that's statistics, but I think there's a great importance also to have a better understanding of individual stories of multilingualism and language use. Now I'm gonna conclude with one point, which is just to try to show uh, in my view, why data is so important. And this is simply based on data um, from the census. Um, is poor English on the rise? Is it, is it increasing? Well, Alan Tudge, Minister for Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs, um, I'll say quietly together with Pauline Hansen, says yes. He says that the absolute, according to the census, the absolute number and proportion of the Australian population not speaking English has increased significantly. I think we've all heard that. And I think we might be tempted, maybe we've heard it so often that we're inclined to believe it. Now, I want just to have a look at the graphs. Um, and these are based on census data. So the absolute number not speaking English well or not well has increased significantly. That's the orange line here. So we can accept it has increased, yeah? Significantly, I'm not sure. Let's have a look at the blue line. This is, this is people who um, speak a language other than English, but speak, an, speak it well or very well. So what's happening here? The absolute number of people not speaking English yeah, it's increasing, but the, the number who speak English well and very well is increasing faster. It's increasing much faster. Um, and if we look at the other side, um, the proportion of the Australian population not speaking English has increased significantly. Now, this is the blue line at the bottom. This is the proportion of the population who say that they speak English not well or not at all, yeah? Um, and is it increasing significantly? I'm not sure, it's increasing a little bit, yeah? Um, but let's have a look at this. The orange line shows the percentage of speakers of languages other than English who say that they speak English not well or not at all. And what's happening there? It's falling, okay? So among people who, among the population who speak a language other than English, or say they speak a language other than English, their English proficiency is actually improving. Now, the, the trick here, the trick that's being performed by telling us that the number and proportion is increasing, well, of course, the population is increasing. So, of course, that number is increasing and immigration accounts for a lot of the population increase. But when we look at the English proficiency or reported English proficiency of speakers of languages other than English, Quite surprisingly, in terms of what we're told again and again and again in the media, it's actually getting better. The English proficiency is getting better. Now, there's a whole number of questions about that that we could go into later, if you like. Does it really matter? Um, um, do, we, do we need to insist that 
English proficiency is so high among the whole population. Um, that, that's another issue that we can discuss. But the point I simply want to make here is that there really is a need for accurate data and accurate data reporting because a lot of the discourse on multilingualism and multiculturalism that we're receiving through the media is, is actually simply wrong. And when we look at the data uh, a little bit more closely, we see an entirely different picture. So at that point, I'm going to conclude and I'm going to hand over, I think, to Oriana and she'll hand over to John. Presentation, very interesting. I'm pretty sure that we're going to have other things. But now um, it is my pleasure to introduce um, uh, John uh, Hasek. Um, John is Professor of Italian Study and Deputy Head of the School of Language and Linguistics at Melbourne University. Uh, he's also the Director of the Research Unit for Multilingualism and Cross-Cultural Communication. His research interests include language education, linguistic diversity, and understanding and supporting multilingualism. So welcome, John, and we're all here ready to listen to you. Thank you very much and thank you very much for the invitation to speak today it's a, it's really a great um a great privilege i'm going to share a screen now that'll that'll hopefully uh just see this one here that'll take some of the points uh um from oh, didn't everyone see that is that visible so here here you go unfortunately our our uni my university's um Templates aren't as nice, pretty as the Macquarie ones, I have to say. Uh, but anyway, that's a, that's a different point. So I've, I've just got some uh, things to say. I'm in general agreement with what Phil says, but I, uh, there's, there's also some interesting uh, alternative ways of, of thinking about things. And certainly the issue of super diversity, you know, there's no doubt the statistics are very clear. Uh, but, but I think one of the issues that we have to bear in mind is that we've only really brought our attention to a lot of these things in recent times because we're able to collect data, data on it. And I'll talk about in particular uh, the census data. So uh, the thing about, uh, that certainly Australia is changing. Did you notice? Um, and uh, it's changing in many interesting different ways in terms of uh, its, its language and, and population mix. That's absolutely right. Uh, but what's interesting about Australia is it's a multilingual and multicultural contradiction and there are many contradictions so for instance we know that indigenous pre-settlement Australia was highly multilingual approximately possibly 300 languages and yet today um, those that, that uh, those languages are highly threatened many many are dormant and uh, only a small number are actually being spoken by children today it's, it's actually quite a, um, a disturbing statistic there has been in recent years significant investment on the part of government authorities to try and support language maintenance and language revival uh, in those communities. And that's, that's really important work. Uh, and on the other hand, non-Indigenous Australia has never been more multilingual and diverse. And that's particularly evident in two places, that's Melbourne and Sydney. And what's interesting is we have to understand that each Australian city is very different in the, in the way things are happening. So Sydney is, uh, the proportion of people who are overseas born in Sydney appears to be rising faster than anywhere else. And this is a, um, a, a statistical side effect of other things that are happening in Sydney. And in particular, the fact that large numbers of Sydney siders are moving out uh, and they're being replaced by people uh, who are coming in from overseas. So for many years now, uh, large numbers of Sid uh, Sydney siders are moving uh, particularly up to Queensland, but actually also down to other uh, outside of Sydney into New South Wales and also to Melbourne and other places. And um, uh, in terms of Melbourne, what you're getting is that massive growth of overseas migration that's occurring. Uh, and both cities, a large part of it is due to international students. Uh, is, is actually being masked by um, popula domestic population growth. So Melbourne is taking people from the, the rest of the country at the same time. As Phil uh, was noticing, the census has many problems and I absolutely agree. And census takers aren't, uh, uh, aren't necessarily interested in language data. In fact, 
Um, at one point, they removed the language question, the only language question on the census, saying it cost $16 million to get that information. And there was a campaign to make sure it was reins uh, reinserted in the following um, census, because actually it's the best we have, but highly, highly problematic. And I, I, I don't want to um, talk about that uh, because it's about self-report. And the question is, is actually very unusual in many respects, because it doesn't ask about your language proficiency. It asks about what language do you usually speak at home in addition to English? Uh, but what we do know, and in recent years, the census has tried um, to increase the, uh, the fine grain um, recording of languages, but there is a lot of catching up to do. And we have been, um, uh, in the past, we've been somewhat uh, misled by the, the census statistics. So for instance, uh, if you look at the, the figures for Italian, it always gives you a single figure. But that actually a figure for Italian masks the significant uh, linguistic diversity in that community that's reporting Italian, because every single person who put in I speak Sicilian at home or I speak Veneto at home is reassigned to Italian. And these languages are very different from what we teach, what we think of as standard Italian, but that's a different question. What we do know is that there is a huge uh, range of um, languages under the radar and the census isn't necessarily picking them up, although it's doing a better job. And so for instance, uh, I think 2009, 2010, Musgrave and Hajek, we did a study looking at speakers of Sudanese languages in Melbourne. And the previous best estimate, they had been able to identify 15 languages. This was a, a, a report, not the census. And we managed, I think, to identify 42 languages. Uh, and also a lot of confusion, even around the um, big languages, and confusion about appropriate uh, provision of language services. It turned out that in the South Sudanese community, uh, Sudanese Arabic is one of two varieties. It's actually a variety of Arabic spoken by the Arabic population, as well as another variety of Arabic uh, sometimes called Juba. And they're not mutually intelligible, uh, but this wasn't the, the um, service providers weren't aware of that particular challenge. So if we go, oh, I should do slide, slideshow, shouldn't I? Sorry, I'm a bit, oops, let's go do this. This is better. All right, there's also another bigger challenge and I've spoken about this in the past. Um, I, I often use humor to get the message across. And uh, the two big challenges for Australia is that there is a, a very strong monolingual mindset uh, that English is enough. And there are very good reasons why this is the case. We know that English gives us incredible social and economic cap uh, capital. Everyone wants to speak English in the world apparently. And we also live in a particular uh, construct. We, we might call it the Anglosphere, the English speaking world. But I like to think of it as a bubble because it, it kind of protects us in some straight, if, if that's, uh, if, if that's uh, what you'd like to use, it either protects us or cuts us off from what's happening around us. And I have many, many examples that I've cited uh, over the years to show you examples. For instance, pop music phenomena that we are almost bliss, blissfully uh, unaware of in the English speaking world, but you know, uh, uh, very well known elsewhere. So what we do know is that most Australians are okay with uh, multi-diversity, um, but when you ask Australians what the best feature of multiculturalism is, 95% uh, of them say it's food. I don't think that's a bad thing. That's actually food is a social unifier. It's a way of breaking through boundaries, uh, but it means that we do have a lot of work to do in terms of getting people to, to appreciate and understand what multilingual multicultural diversity and the benefits are. And it is possible for many people not to interact with that diversity. The other issue is what are our expectations? How do we support multilingualism? Well, I'll show you that there are two kinds of multilingualism. I'm sorry, I'm being a bit the devil's advocate today, but I think these are uh, potentially useful talking points for us if, if these are the kinds of things that we'd like to talk about. And I contrast the European Union, where, which has uh, a public policy, a, 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 an officially stated policy that every single European Union citizen should be trilingual. And that is not one language, not two languages, but three languages uh, should be in the repertoire of every European Union citizen. Uh, and this is very much what we call additive multilingualism. You have a language and you add another one. And this particular case, you add another one. There is a particular driver for trilingualism here. It's because they know that most people want English 
and they want to make sure that people have uh, as a second language uh, or want English as a second language. And this is a way of ensuring there's, there's greater linguistic diversity. In Australia, uh, it's by implication, even though political discourse supports um, uh, 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 multicultural, multi, multilingual citizens, but in practice, uh, we have a different process where you, you may start, and this is say, say a child who's learning English, uh, who, sorry, comes from a non-English speaking family, the first language is not English, and they enter school, and typically what happens is that by the end of um, primary school, they will be uh, uh, English speaking or, or only English speaking or primarily English speaking. There are good drivers uh, behind that, but we have to, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily positive. It's, it's around concerns around NAPLAN testing, various other things, but it's a long standing tradition uh, in this country. It, it's not actually a new thing. Uh, but again, there is a lot of public discourse in favor of multiculturalism and multilingualism. The question we have is, how do we make that work so that students, children entering school with another language are able successfully to learn English success, uh, uh, high levels of English proficiency, but also to, to maintain their uh, community language. I'm from the 20th century. And in those days, it was, I, I'm from the time before multiculturalism. And in those days, it was very explicit. You weren't to keep your language. People were to move to an English uh, only um, lifestyle. So what is the challenge of keeping languages? We do do some things uh, well. SBS radio is a really good example. There's a lot of language languages uh, 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 broadcast every day there. So it's really positive. There's a lot of community. Uh, radio as well, which plays an important role, and we have community television as well. SBS television is is slightly less su successful in supporting uh, language diversity, but th there are reasons for that. Uh, of course, and if, for those of us who are educators, uh, language educators here, and I know I can I recognise some of the names in the audience. Language education in our schools is a challenge, uh, whether at state level or nationally. Uh, and uh, there's too many reasons, uh, there's too much time to, uh, not enough time, I should say, to explain this, but it, there are many challenges on many different fronts there. And then the issue of, obviously, as the proportion of people um, uh, who, who arrive in Australia, who uh, speak a language other than English at home, many of these communities obviously want to support community language maintenance. The question is, what is the best uh, and most effective way of supporting community language maintenance through community language schools, other initiatives, um, et cetera. And uh, some of these initiatives can actually be quite small. One of the problems for smaller communities is access to resources. So you might want to Google RUMAC, just Google it and go to resources and you'll see some of the things that we've been doing in terms of creating very cheap, very low resource, very low tech, uh, low skill uh, reading materials, because that responds uh, to the needs of communities, not just in Australia, uh, but elsewhere. And on that point, I'd like to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for that fascinating presentation. And uh, both John and Phil's presentation have raised some really important issues. Um, in the next segment, I'm going to ask a few questions for, from, uh, for both of our speakers and, and Oriana and I will alternate and ask, um, ask some different things as, as we go through. So the, one of the things that really fascinated me, um, in, particularly in, um, in Phil's presentation, was about um, the, the doubling of internet and mobile phone use and the, um, the much greater um, ability for people to to use their own their heritage language or their community language in communication with people in their own country. Now I'm interested in this partly because I've looked at um, regional variation, so socio-pragmatic variation in, in a heritage language. And the research I did showed that there were um, there were definitely some diaspora forms of language of of um, of the language which were around maybe 20 30 years ago and these seem to have basically died out with this greater internationalization so i was very interested in what you thought um, would be the effect of these different types of communication and the technological communication um, channels that we now have 
on the users of these language languages and who they get to use the languages with and how and why. So that's sort of a question for Phil, but it's actually open for either of the speakers. Phil, would you like to respond? You're muted. Yeah, it's a bit slow. <laughs> um, I think um, the, this, this phenomenon uh, is very well documented qualitatively in there's a lot of studies which are showing that um, the whole idea of migration as sort of you live somewhere and you go and move and you live somewhere else sort of pretty much forever that this is not what migration is about anymore that it's uh, very often a, um, a more going back and forth process both physically because people sort of return home more often um, um, and wherever home is, they have two homes. Uh, so they're sort of always returning home mm. in two directions. And um, also through use of social media um, and, and, um, and, and particularly sort of satellite or it's not satellite anymore, is it? It's cable, whatever, Netflix or um, watching the crickets in India or where or or whatever it is you do, you know some sort of interest that you have back home. Um, I think in terms of uh, so one of the phenomena that was sort of noted about the um, the twentieth century migrant communities was that they had a certain kind of um, nostalgia that mm. the the way the diaspora culture developed was was kind of in terms of a, of a kind of nostalgia and a certain sort of conservatism. Um, and so I guess there was a kind of, I, I don't know enough about the details of any particular language to say that John might know a lot more about that. Yeah. Um, but this idea really that, um, that, that sort of languages were kind of preserved or dialects were kind of preserved. Um, I do know at the moment in New York, there's a City University of New York, there's a whole project documenting endangered languages uh, from around the world, which actually only exists, which seem to be only spoken or used in New York, among people in New York who've not stopped, stopped using them. And, and I think your question really is about, is that changing now? And I think uh, almost certainly it is. And one of, the, um, one of the things I think would be a factor in that would be the, there's probably a tendency that's been well documented in social media use, uh, where you get sort of global diaspora communities to communicate with each other through across borders with social media. You get a lot of language mixing, you get a lot of mixing of whatever language is, um, is, is the sort of focal language, but a lot of language mixing of that language with English or whatever the dominant language of the community is. So I'll just, that's what I can say. Okay, John, would you like to comment John, on that, Jim? Yeah, um, uh, it's quite well known, those of uh, anyone involved with the Italian community, that one of the common pieces of feedback when um, uh, migrants from, from the 1950s or, or 60s who, you know, who live in this country, they go back to Italy, a common comment is, you hear this all the time, is, my goodness, no one's spoken like that. We haven't heard those words for 50 years or 60 years. Where did you learn that word? Mm -hmm. And of course, what, what's happened is back in the home country, these dialects have now had significant continuous interaction with, with Italian. And so they're now heavily influenced by Italian in a way that there, there simply isn't this type of contact here. Uh, there are also other patterns that you get here in the diaspora. So what happens is uh, people from different parts of Italy actually merge towards a kind of Italian koine that's very local to um, Australia, that, that um, you know, it's regional and doesn't really matter, you know, which part of Italy you come from, but it's a kind of uh, Italian koine. And they were, you, you know, there's a lot of code switching because of course there are concepts that are only understandable in Australia. So anyone who knows, uh, you know, um, you know um, Italian, 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 uh, board of works, Italian, Italian. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, things like loan words and calcs. So, you know, to paint the fence becomes pentare la fence. Uh, 
which of course is completely unintelligible to anyone back in Italy. But when you, you are a speaker of this variety and you go back to Italy, it's not like you realize this is what you're doing. You know, people may either pretend to understand what you're saying or, uh, or query you and you, you know, often you have to actually relearn, relearn the language. And if I can just very quickly, but my, my mother has been here 60 years, she's Slovenian. And she, you know, she's been commenting late, lately, you know, she's been here 60 years now. She doesn't know anymore how people speak uh, back there. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's absolutely a, a, a fair enough comment. A lot has happened uh, since then. And uh, what, you know, what happens here is, is completely unrelated to what happens over there. And just in terms of mobility, I just want to, um, uh, uh, Phil's got, you know, the, the, the question of mobility and transnationalism and the ability to come backwards and forwards there is a really interesting fact is that 50 years ago, it, used, it was uh, 80 weeks worth of salary to pay for a return airfare uh, back to Europe and back. And I remember my mother always saying, because we went back once in the 70s, my mother saying, we had to decide whether we bought a house or we traveled mm -hmm. back to Europe with um, the children. That was the actual, um, the extent of the cost. Uh, before COVID, that 80 weeks had actually reduced officially to two and a half weeks of Australian salary. It's amazing. So the ability of anyone, and actually uh, you could get tickets that were cheaper, you could get them for one week's worth of an average Australian salary. So the possibility of travel, in, independent of the technology today, compared to what it was 40, 50 years ago, is extraordinary, which explains Phil's, you know, the, the, the Phil's figures about the number of arrivals international arrivals landing in Australia. It, you know, it's all part of this mega global process of uh, enabling travel. And of course, when you do that, people will travel. Mm -hmm. Right, um, Oriana might like to ask the next question. Okay. Exciting. Um, in, in terms of, you know, that- uh, no, no, You missed, missed the beginning of your question. Ah. Am I mute? You're not muted. No, no. fine. I know. Just okay. Begin, just the first part was muted. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would love to move a bit more into the socialist sphere. Um, we know that in terms of multi multilingualism, at the level of the people and the education, there's a lot there. That's what I hear today. A lot. Uh, community language for the maintenance of language, where it seems like I'm still not very successful. And I attended a meeting um, recently, and the social issue was uh, people speak the language, but they're not really fluent. We, we're talking about the children that are coming through the school. And then they said, uh, we also ended up with the problem that our current translators and interpreter are retiring because that's where we got, you know, many years ago, people with really strong language skill, language skill. And it seems like now we are losing them and we don't have the replacement because we don't have people who are coming with a great interest in masses to take uh, languages at uh, the level of university perhaps. So, I feel that uh, the support that we have to the language maintenance, not multiculturalism, because in Australia, people are very much into that. They like it. It's the language which becomes a problem. I feel that the Saturday school, the Department of Education, everyone, but it's kind of fragmented. It's not together. Now, here's my question. In 1987, Professor Lobianco presented to the government the national language policy. And it was very comprehensive because he talked about economics, enrichment of culture, intellectual power, equality for social justice, and the position of Australia um, in the world. And that is absolutely true now. So the thing is, what can we do to support multilingualism and bring everybody together to reactivate this policy. No policy, no strong policy 
And then we have an example like this one that you will observe that we all acknowledge that this is a multilingual society, but the way how we express um, is monolingual. And I think COVID put that really strong in the, in the message. Uh, Melbourne was one of the big one coming saying, yeah, sure, um, but we need to not only use the language, we need to use the language in a context of culture. So what I think is how we do support multilingualism, how we can go get together and redevelop that policy that we need or talk about a policy that tick all the boxes that we need. Do you want to go first, John? Yeah, well, oh, the policy. OK. I know, I know. <laughs> this is a really big challenge. <clears throat> I, look, I agree. It would be really good to have a coherent policy um, at national and, and, and state level. Uh, one of the challenges for a long time has been um, funding. You need to resource it, and people are obviously uh, hesitant about resourcing this. Um, there is a big project underway at the moment, uh, um, uh, funded by the government, uh, uh, led by the AFMLTA, the Australian Federation of Modern Lang Language Teacher Associations, that's collecting information and trying to put together a plan. But that very clearly not allowed to use the word policy. Um, you know, because that, that becomes uh, very complicated. One of the problems too, is if you use the word policy, if and when a government changes, what governments do is they get rid of preceding policy. So you have to, you know, it's a very delicate, um, very delicate strategic issue. Um, so, but I'm, you know, I'm absolutely in, in support, support of a more consistent, more coherent and more substantial um, contribution government contribution to supporting multilingualism, not just of communities, but particularly those children who should be given the wonderful opportunity of learning another language properly in school as well. I mean, I think that's really important as well. Everyone should be given the opportunity to become bilingual, multilingual. Yeah, I just, I, I wanna add to that, that um, I, I, I think, Oriana, you kind of answered your own question because that, that's, ah, that's it's what we're doing, you know, through through discussions like this, um, you know, we, we're doing that. Now, the question is, do we need a, a language policy in the sense of something that's kind of 450 pages long and with, with lots of paragraphs and notes and things like that? Or do we need um, something that's a bit more of a movement or a kind of shared understanding of what are the what what are the best practices um and uh be, and i say that because um i've heard joe libianco say i think he's got a collection of several hundred language policy <laughs> documents <laughs> published in at least 50 yeah. reports that he wrote you know, 50 reports yeah. that he has a, a historical overview yeah in a, but in addition to his own it's yeah. it's uh you know there's been a lot of documentation and whether that how you know, what happens because of documents, who, who knows? I think the, I wasn't here in 1987, but I understand that the document that Joe's language policy was adopted, but then the Howard government came along and it it, it just kind of- No, it actually, quietly. It, was the, it was the Labour government that- it was the uh, Labour government, Michelle, <laughs> the government okay. came to mind for different yeah. reasons. Yeah, okay. But what, but what I do want to say is that I think that we really do need to think about language policy in different ways, simply because there are so many more languages mm. involved and, and, and the different sizes of the language communities, if there are even language, you know, if we can even call them language communities, in some cases they are communities, in some cases they're, they're a kind of bunch of different groups of people, different communities that happen to speak the same language um, and I think we we really do need to think about how to be responsive to that and I think you know I've heard people talking a lot about um, community driven initiatives mm -hmm. um, support for community driven initiatives has been very important um, of um, uh, speakers of languages having a voice um, having having opportunities to speak 
um, for themselves rather than be spoken for, as I am doing at the moment. Um, um, so I think there are very important issues that, you know, that could be brought forth through a discussion around language policy, but where that leads to in the end, I'm not quite sure. I'd like to know what other people think about that. Um, okay, well, we might have a chance in the, uh, in the broader discussion to get a few more people's ideas on that. Um, I, I think I have time for one more question. I'd like to just take you back to the data again. And um, many of us have been quite alarmed by the, the statistics data that we do and we don't have. Um, that is the, the, the question about what language you speak in the home being not the right question. And also the fact that we're lucky to have even that question. Um, what I wanted to ask the panelists is, um, is there a better model anywhere else for doing this? And, and also what kind of advocacy would, uh, would help to improve the situation so that the census could provide data that was actually useful? Let's go to John first. He's nodding there. He looks oh, interested in that question. It's a challenge. It really does need a, um, a you know, uh, as Phil and I were saying, there have been many, 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 many reports on language education uh, in this country, and they will continue uh, to come out. So uh, I'm looking forward to the, uh, I think what we need is up-to-date data. Uh, I, I agree totally with Phil that we need data sets. One of the issues is um, that we actually don't have uh, up-to-date data on for instance, on who's learning what languages at school. Uh, my research unit was commissioned in 2006 to, uh, to prepare a report on that. That was confidential and never saw the light of day be because not, uh, people were anxious. They didn't want that data to be seen because they thought it would cast a negative light on their um, jurisdiction. So that, that's a challenge. Someone's referred to Canada as an example of additive multilingualism. And, I, and that's sometimes taken to be a useful comparator to Australia. I mean, they, with Australia, they led the, the charge towards multiculturalism and to multilingualism. Of course, they have a really unusual situation. They have a population that is 20, 22% uh, French speaking, mostly in Quebec. However, I just saw a statistic the other day that actually, despite all the efforts, uh, only 11% of uh, first language English speakers in Canada are bilingual in French. So it does take a lot of work, particularly in the case of in English speaking environments. Um, and we have to think about what the best possible way of addressing that challenge is. How do you engender interest and support uh, it, it, um, amongst everybody, not just communities, but amongst everybody in favor of other languages, multilingualism, bilingualism, et cetera. That's the challenge. Thank you. But that actually um, leads into another question I'd like to ask about what do you think are the main obstacles that prevent adult monolingual English speakers in established communities from being interested in learning a second language? I'm not just talking about children, but adults in actually partaking in second language. Well, I've, got a, I've got a simple answer to that. The answer is none. There are, there, <laughs> there are really no excuses. It's actually never been easier to engage with language learning, uh, technology that Phil's pointed to, Duolingo, all of those sorts of things, uh, the ability to travel, the ability to do immersion language. We know, we now know actually there's good research showing that adult, that many adult learners can actually develop really high proficiency. Uh, you know, you don't have to be a small child to learn a language well. So, you know, there are lots of, you know, positive, positives we can point to to encourage adults to, to learn another language. Thank you. So, um, Oriana? Could I, sorry, could I just come in quickly sure. with a brief answer on your, the census question? Because there's been quite a lot of discussion of that in the chat, I can see. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to say that the problem with the census question is that there's only one question. Exactly. And so it, it has to be, and it has to be a very specific question. Now, some people say the New Zealand question which is um, which languages can you have a conversation in is a better, is a better question. But um, in fact, it's arguably, it doesn't produce very useful data. It kind of gives a better impression of what gives a better picture of what language is spoken and, and people's competences, but it doesn't provide particularly useful information. So I think what we need really is more, 
well, two things. One is probably we need a comprehensive sociolinguistic survey mm -hmm. of people's, um, and, and somebody got to, serve, got to fund that, uh, because as John said, it's $16 million for one question in the census. So that, that would need funding and some commitment to gathering language data. But the other thing is, I think in things like um, education, health, employment, and so on, there's massive amounts of language data, um, which is not processed, which is mm -hmm. not, or it's not, you can't get hold of it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. nobody's putting it together. So I think there's, uh, there's maybe work to be done there in compiling different and bringing together different data sets. Um, but the, the census question issue is, it's definitely the wrong question, but if you're only gonna ask one question, it's always gonna be the wrong question. Um, and it, well, actually, they're two questions, and they're both the wrong question. <laughs> I, I agree with Phil. Yeah, and usually, but... that, the, the, the way the question is worded in New Zealand explains why there are so apparently there are so many French speakers in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Oriana. Did you want to ask one more before we go to the um, chat? Yes. Well, my mind always sits with kind of the practical side. Uh, I can see the conversation going in there and said, oh, we need more exposure for the language learning. Uh, we need more support. We need more promotion. It's probably marketing. Um, what we do at the State Library is to support the community group that are interested in maintaining language and inviting people to participate because it's fun. Um, so there is something called the Sydney Language Festival, completely non-for-profit based on a person who is a chair, he's Russian and he's passionate about Russian. So he wants everybody to learn at least one or two sentences. Uh, and he has gathered people with the same interest. Then we have Mother Language Day, that he come from Bangladesh because at some point they were forbidden to speak their own language and there were some, you know, um, some tragedies around their age. And, and so they're also trying to promote and work with libraries. And libraries actually support the learning of le English uh, through the English conversation classes. And interesting enough, it's a lot of people who have retired. And all those people, we all know the story of the migrant. It happened in my family. Somebody arrived and we need to find accommodation, all the fundamental thing and somebody's going to miss out. And normally it's the breadwinner who miss out on going to classes of English, but now they have retired. So we have a whole new group of people coming through. They want that they are going to need the support when they go to the doctor, in the nursing home, and it actually is not very strong. So that when the social issue come up. So I'm thinking um, there might be an intelligent approach uh, that he, get the message out and it may be only up to fine point that we can disseminate to the entire state, I suppose. I saw a couple of really interesting things. I just didn't have the time to catch it. <laughs> so if we do something that is like community-based, what, what do you think that it would be your recommendation to think about? if we're going to have a common voice. Can I, can I, I something in the chat, I think Suzanne Grasso has um, put in an interesting comment there about a common voice is that we, um, we have to address that negative attitude about learning another language in schools. Uh, and this unfortunately is coming from within schools themselves. We really have to get the message across to teachers, to school principals and to parents that learning another language is a really important thing for their children's um, personal, social and intellectual development. So if that is one thing that we could all do, that would be really, really important. And unfortunately, what Suzanne reports is far too common. Okay, well, perhaps we'll take a few questions from the chat now. Um, one here from Tina Detwala, who says, what are the particular issues in regional and rural areas compared to cities? 
uh, maybe well, one. Totally <laughs> Just put a rope round my neck, did I? <laughs> uh, they're particular. Um, they're different in different places. But uh, um, well, I mean, one 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 point is that um, uh, in some parts of regional Australia, then indigenous languages, Northern Territory particularly, indigenous languages are numerically and um, in terms of numbers of speakers, uh, far, far more significant than they are in Sydney and Melbourne. I, I know it, in New South Wales, I think there are four, there are four languages in New South Wales or indigenous languages in New South Wales that have more than um, 500 speakers, if I'm correct. Mm. Um, um, so in New South, and I think Victoria is a similar situation. Um, so that would be that would be one one example. Um, the other example is that you have um, what would you call them? Sort of maybe enclaves. I mean, you have small towns up in Queensland where you might have a very large group of Portuguese speakers who who are sort of working in the meat industry, working in a meat factory or. Um, so in general, in, in regional Australia, where you have, um, it, normally there's, it's, it's really, other than indigenous languages, you have an overwhelming majority of English speakers, but you do have the, you have sort of pockets um, of speakers of other languages. And in that sense, you know, they're, they're a small group of people, they speak the same language, they're, they're, they're living in a town with where the vast majority are speaking English and so on. So that becomes a very particular mm. issue for that. that. Clearly the challenge for heritage language maintenance is, is a lot more difficult in regional areas where there are, there are not the numbers to sustain um, schools to teach them as well. Well, there's that, that's another mm. issue, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, community language schools are very, very strong in, uh, in, in cities. cities. They're, very yeah. strong. They're strong in Melbourne. Uh, but as you move outwards, they, they they are strong in other areas as well. But um, the tendency is for people to be much further away from a, from a school that is teaching the language they want to learn. We have a lot of comments here, um, some about areas that we've already looked at, about language policies. Um, can, I, can I also... And, um, and since yeah, that it, can I invite um, Bayan? Um, she raised her hands and she seems to have a question. Mm -hmm. Please go uh, on. Yes. Hi. Uh, this is Bayan Shama. I'm from Auckland University, New Zealand, but I'm currently still living in Dubai. I want to ask I'm studying uh, family language policies for um, a Muslim community in Auckland. Uh, so the situation there is they mainly have three languages. They have their heritage language and they choose to teach their children Arabic because they are Muslims and they want to, them to, to learn Arabic. And uh, they have, of course, English as a mainstream language. So my question is how to support uh, these families on the micro level, on day-to-day -day language uh, choices with their children because um, you know it's difficult for the new generation now. They, they with, with all this globalization, they want to. Uh, they are driven by monolingual as as Anglo speakers. They want to speak English, but also the, the parents have another ideology and another uh, choices for their children. So uh, yeah, how to support these parents to manage. And yeah, I want to add that mainly these parents are from 1.5 generation. They grow up in diaspora, but they were born in their uh, original uh, countries. Um, and another question, how do you think that uh, ethnographic studies can enrich this uh, area of research? I mean, I can talk, uh, Philip, you're, I can talk briefly about my experience here, here in Melbourne. There are some communities that are not traditionally first language Arabic speaking that for cultural and religious reasons, 
uh, are very keen on learning Arabic. So there are a number of, actually of community language schools here in Melbourne that are run by non-traditionally Arabic speaking communities in which children are taught um, Arabic. And so that, that's, but not those, community, those communities don't necessarily all do that. So some members of the community may set up a community language school that um, a good example is Somali and other mem members of that community may set up an Arabic school. So, I mean, that's, an in that's a really interesting choice where non-linguistic identity um, is favored over li uh, traditional linguistic identity. And that obviously adds a challenge to those communities because actually that language is not usually spoken in the home. Arabic is not spoken at home. And yeah. they are relying on the community language school for the child to learn Arabic successfully. But I don't think there's been any any research done on that that I'm aware of. Phil, maybe you know. Um, well, well, what I know is that there's been very little research done on 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 Arabic language maintenance in Australia, um, and and actually generally on on Asian languages. And I think it's um, it's not I, I can't I'm not answering your question directly. And I think it's possibly somebody in the audience who's got more expertise on family language policy than I have. Um, but but I, what I'm aware of is that some of the so-called bigger languages in, um, in, in Sydney, especially Arabic, Hindi, Chinese, they are not exactly heritage languages for, most, for, for many of the people who say that they speak those languages. They're languages of a kind of wider communication. <laughs> Um, and the home language is, um, is could be a dialect or even a different even a different language. And this is a, a particular kind of um, you know in Australia we have we have Maltese immigrants who speak Maltese and it's quite clear that they come from Malta and Maltese is their language. Um, but I think with Arabic speakers, with Hindi speakers, also to some extent with Chinese speakers, that that doesn't hold up and there are very special issues involved with those with those languages but i don't know possibly there's somebody in the audience who does have a more expertise in family language policy who could come in so is there any, anyone who'd like to come in from the audience if i can comment it is absolutely right it's not just arabic chinese is a classic example People, uh, chi people who speak uh, a Chinese language are now uh, typically only sending their children to Mandarin Chinese school. That didn't used to be the case. There used to be quite a number of Cantonese schools, uh, for instance, which has a, you know, a, a long-standing written tradition and supported by learning in schools in Hong Kong in particular. So, and that's absolutely spot on. Hindi is another one. Uh, lots, of, lots of people from North India who are not first language Hindi would be, uh, would be speaking Hindi at home. And for logical reasons, I mean, there are, um, you know, uh, patterns at home that, that would be supported here. I, I was told um, in the case of Hindi that many people who are coming from all over India, they are coming as, uh, this, this relates to the temporary transitory migration thing, they're coming over for, uh, for an indefinite period of time and expecting to go back to India but they don't know which part of India they're going to go back to, where they're going to be able to find a job. So from that perspective, although they may not speak Hindi at home, they feel that it's useful for their kids to know Hindi and even for themselves to know Hindi so that they can be more flexible in terms of returning back to India. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, about the situation with language languages in Australian universities and the cuts that are being made to languages in Australian universities. Um, would, would the panelists like to comment on, on that and the implications of that for oh, multilingualism? Yeah. So I just I, want to say thank you. <laughs> so, thank you, Bayan. Oh, look, I can talk, talk about languages at university because I actually teach language at university and I, I was um, also president of the Languages and Cultures Network for Australian universities. Unfortunately, there's a pattern in Australia that when things get difficult, uh, you know, there's a process of attrition and uh, reduction. 
and uh, language departments uh, often are easy easy pickings. Uh, the good news is there's a you know there are a number of um, universities around the country that, that have announced that they would like to close a, a specific small uh, language programs these uh, with small numbers of staff and students. But the good news is actually that they are organising um, and th there may be some reversal of these um, these decisions. The, the really the biggest problem at universities is that universities make it hard for people to do to study languages. Um, at university. It's a question of access. So you're a science student and you turn up and you may be allowed to do one, maybe two subjects in your degree that's not part of a science degree. So that really makes it, so if, what we, what, when, we, when you provide them with access, all of a sudden they're willing to do, the, the students are very happy to language study. We just have to be, we have to make it accessible to them. And that's really the, the big challenge and remove all the blockers that stop children as students from continuing with their language study at university. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on that? I, I'm not directly involved in teaching of languages at the university, um, but clearly I think I'd go back to the comment that Zoriana made earlier is that, that there, there needs to be sort of language maintenance at every level, and particularly mm. at that higher level of uh, universities. So, um, the um, the the languages in industry is growing massively, um, and there's a lot of machines involved in that, uh, but there's still demand for. Um, um, people to work with machine translation, to work with automatic translation and so on. And uh, I think Australia is a little bit short-sighted if it, if, it, if it doesn't see the potential in the language industries. Um, one thing I would say is that ev every other country in the world is producing reports on the importance of foreign languages. Mm -hmm. um, the UK, in the US, there are these quite big high profile reports coming out and um, but we're not doing that so maybe we need to do that. Indeed. Um, Oriana do you want to take a few questions now? Um, I was just look, trying to find the, the comments and to see if there's uh, someone who wants to ask something. You can see it. Yeah. I know that uh, this is the opportunity will open with all this conversation on how to work together and what are we going to do. The report, I think, is going to inform us of what can we do? What can we do to support um, multilingualism? Can I start on this? Mm -hmm. I think look, uh, every. Uh, I think it, um, we've tried multiple approaches top down. Um, I think one of the things we have to do as individuals is actually support support multilingualism. There's lots we can do as individuals and create that that groundswell. Ironically, or ironically, for the reasons that Phil talked about, we have a lot more communities now. Uh, once upon a time, it was it was in a sense easier to organise. Uh, for, for communities to organise, uh, you know, really big community, and it was always the big ones. It was the it was the Greek and the Italian, and the Chinese community, and the, you know, possibly the German communities. It was those really big ones. Now you have a, a huge diversity of languages, and getting u unity and um, unity and getting everyone working together is really really the challenge. Uh, but we have to talk to government officials. Um, a lot of what happens in Australia, especially government level is based on personal interest. So the current uh, Minister for Education, Tian, he's, he's, uh, he's been public, very public about his support for language education in this country. And he's very public about the reasons why, because he had a light bulb moment when he was posted overseas. But it's really that personal engagement that makes, that makes the difference, I think. And we also have to be, sorry if I can just add one thing, we have to be careful about the arguments that we use in favor of languages. In the UK, uh, in particular, I get worried about the emphasis on economics and dollars. 
because actually um, there's a lot more to languages than, than dollars. It's always the British Academy which writes these reports, often talks about, look at the economic cost. And there is an economic cost, but it's also about intellectual, academic, personal and intercultural development. And I think we have to refer to all of those things in terms of making our case as to why um, multilingualism and multiculturalism are good for us. And the best thing is that the, that the benefits are, are lifelong and we're delaying the onset of Alzheimer's. So, I mean, it's a win-win situation. Yeah, I, I just want to add to that, that um, um, I think it's important that we refine our arguments that we discuss and that we, there are, I, the positive thing is that I think there are far more organizations and groups of people working with languages and working around languages and cultures than there were in the past. And um, um, the kind of um, collaborations that we can have with community groups and university research centers and so on. I think these are really important moving forward, but I, I do agree that we need to be careful with our arguments. I did refer, um, my problem with the British Academy report is not so much its emphasis on economics as its emphasis on English. It's kind of like um, <laughs> these reports come out from English speaking countries and they're um, often promoted by, say, the British Council, mm. which is, has a direct interest in teaching English. And, and the starting point is, well, look, let's accept that we are all going to have to speak English really well. And then we look at languages and languages are important as long as we recognize English. So I think we need another way. I'm not saying that English is unimportant. It, it, it is important but we need another way of framing the arguments um, than, than, I, than I've seen from reports that are coming from elsewhere. Um, but I, I think we are, hopefully we're getting there, right? This is what we are trying to do. Um, we're talking more about languages than, than we have in the past and we've got to work together to do that. I agree. I, no, I think there are some real positive signs uh, but we just have to get that, in the interim we have to get that positive message out at all. I, I, sorry, I just wanted to ask a question for Jill and um, and, and Alice. Maybe they, there's a whole discussion going on in the chat, which I, I can't quite keep up with around Oslan. And I wonder if anybody wants to to put a question or make a comment um, on that before we before we. Thank, thanks very much, Phil. I was wondering whether we were going to have time to to put that in. Um, this is my next the next thing I wanted to do. So Darlene has asked, uh, that most of these are in the form of comments rather than questions. Yeah. Uh, but Darlene has said the irony with, with learning Auslan is that non-deaf children are encouraged to learn that deaf children are not. What does this say to the whole language policy, deaf education and the promotion of second language learning in educational settings? Uh, so if anyone would like to take that up and not necessarily our speakers, but anybody who would like to comment on on that or where Auslan fits into the, the full spectrum of multilingualism. Would anyone like to come in? Um, I, I, probably neither of us are experts on Auslan. Yes. I, I, I think it's important to get the view of what, what I'd like to, you know, I think it's important to hear how speakers of Auslan or users, sorry, users of Auslan. I've made my first mistake there. Users of Auslan um, see the language fitting in. I see it as fitting in in a special way. It, it's not um, one more language in a multicultural society. It, it's, a, it's a language that has, a, where, that we have to give a special unique consideration too. And um, my other question, I have a question around that is also um, the role of other sign languages that um, migrant communities may bring with them uh, to Australia, which, which I know very, very little about, um, except that I know that they do exist, that there are, um, that, that there are um, sign languages from other countries that are used in Australia uh, and how that can how that comes in, but I think the the, the 
partly the answer to this issue is what we've talked about voice. And, and again, perhaps obviously voice is probably the wrong word to use here. Um, um, but but the, the communities who have the greatest interest in language have to be sort of given the opportunity and, and the space to, to, to say what they want to do with those languages. So what they want other people to do with those languages. So that would, that would be my answer to that, which doesn't directly address issues concerned with Auslan because I'm, I'm just no, not an expert. It's a much bigger question, but thank you, yeah. Um, okay, well, we're nearly out of time. So uh, I'm just gonna hand over to Alice to wind things up. And, uh, and thank you very much to, to both speakers and to everybody who's participated. And I'm very sorry we didn't get to all of the questions in the chat. There were, um, there were a number of things that we would have liked to deal with if we had another hour or two. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Okay, um, first of all, I want to thank the speakers, um, Phil and Jones, and also the, the co-hosts, Oriana and Jill, for a fantastic um, start of conversations. Can I just say that it's a start of the conversations, and um, the Macquarie Multilingualism Research Center is really invite you to join us in further conversation in 2021, and hopefully we will be meeting each other in person um, very soon over a cup of tea and over a cup of coffee and a piece of cake um, and to, to advocate really that Australia is multicultural and multilingual and we need to advocate the use of languages in every aspect and every domain of our everyday interactions and everyday experience there. So um, I would like to thank everybody for coming in to our initial conversations and we will be in touch and we will um, be um, proactive in calling you up and making friends and advocate further so that we are all in this together and we are all going to make um, Australia a more inclusive um, country for all there. So on that note, have a good evening and have a good day. Goodbye, everybody. And thank you for joining us. And thank you. And um, my apologies. Thank you for the two Oslin interpreters. They have done a fantastic job there. Thank you. Thank you. And back. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye.